Mercy is divine love poured out on misery. Come passion with to suffer. You are made by God's love. You are made for God's love. God's love, which is infinite, inexhaustible, and unconditional, is always super abundant. I want to give you a very concrete way of how to ask God for mercy, for healing from anything that's wounded in your heart. And I'll preface this, this by saying this. Um, if you know there's a, a field of landmines, you should not go out with a big stick and go like, hey, I wonder where the landmine is, okay? <laughs> it's not good. You're going to get hurt, okay? So you want to let Jesus lead. Jesus knows everything in our heart that needs to be touched by his love, and he has wisdom of what to touch, in what order, at what depth, with what frequency and intensity, Right? Because if Jesus came all at once to heal everything that needed to be healed in my heart with his mercy, I would be in the fetal position in the corner for like the next three months, okay? <laughs> and I got work to do, and Jesus knows I have work to do. So he's very gentle, wise of what to touch, in what order, at what depth, okay? So Jesus, is there anything in my heart? This is a great prayer to pray frequently. Jesus, is there anything in my heart that you want to touch with your mercy, with your healing love? Is there any misery that you want to comfort in the power of your love? And then I just wait. And I'll wait five or 10 minutes as I'm praying. And if nothing comes up, fine. I move on and I pray about whatever else is on my mind. But every now and again, Jesus will bring a particular memory to mind. I was thinking the other day of uh, an experience I had in third grade. I had just moved to a new school, and I was making friends with my, you know, third grade buddies. And one day, some other guy in the class got all the people that I was just starting to make friends with to, like, shun me, right? And thanks be to God, that wasn't my experience throughout high school, but it was that, or throughout grade school, sorry. Uh, but it was that day. And I just remember this day on the playground where I just went out like, hey guys, and everyone was just making fun of me, teasing me, wouldn't play, couldn't, I couldn't play in any of the reindeer games, you know, none of that, right? <laughs> and he, this is what happens. That was a hurtful experience. And I hadn't thought of it in years, haven't thought about it probably since then, really. Can't think of any time I've really remembered that since then. Uh, but I never asked the love of God to come into that. So if a specific memory comes up, here's how you pray with it, to ask God's mercy. First of all, let yourself remember. Don't kind of skirt around the memory. Let yourself remember. And as you're remembering, tell God all about it, as if God would know nothing about it unless you told him, right? So I'm like narrating to Jesus. Jesus is like a Tuesday, and it was during the winter, and uh, they were going out to play boot hockey and I wanted to go play boot hockey and they just started making fun of me and making jokes about me and teasing me and they wouldn't let me play and I was sad and I was angry and I was confused. Like, so all my thoughts, feelings, and desires that accompany that memory, I'm telling God all about it. And then here's the grace to ask for. Here's how I ask for mercy. Ask the Father, our Heavenly Father, or ask Jesus. Heavenly Father, Jesus Will you reveal your presence with me in that moment and your love for me in that moment? So like back when I was in third grade, Jesus was with me and the father was with me and they were loving me. But as a third grader, I didn't know how to ask for that or how to receive that. Thanks be to God in his great mercy in my life. I've come a long way in knowing how to ask for what I need from God and to receive it. I got a long way to go, but I've come a long way. And so that third grader, you know, I, can, I think of it as a grown I'm like, that's just stupid. Kids just are dopey. It just lasted a day or two, you know, and these guys were all my friends for the rest of grade school. I was very blessed. That's just smoothing it over. The third grader on that day didn't have that experience. So I'm telling God all about it. I'm asking Jesus to reveal his presence with me and his love for me. And I'm just remembering the day and uh, I remembered where I was sitting watching the guys play boot hockey because I couldn't play with them. And it was in this little snowbank where they had plowed up the snow in the parking lot. And um, in my imagination, what I just experienced was Jesus coming over and sitting down right next to me. And he looked at me. 
And what, was, what I was aware of in this look, this imaginative look, was his desire to be with me. Like he was really happy to have me to himself sitting on that snowbank. And there was something about that, that revelation of the particular way Jesus was loving me in that memory when I was in third grade that I didn't know how to look for or receive as a third grader, but I do today, that just comforted the roughness of that day. That's an, a lived experience of divine mercy. Now, I could have just sort of blown by that and said, oh, that's just a dopey memory from third grade. I've let it go. It's in the past. And um, I could have just moved on. But it would have been a missed opportunity to receive his mercy. So I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. Jesus, on a regular basis, is there anything in my heart that you want to touch with your healing love or with your mercy? And if a particular memory comes up, ask God for that grace. Tell him all about it. Ask him to reveal his presence with you and his love for you. And uh, you'll know when you receive that grace because it'll make a big difference in, uh, in your lived experience. Okay. So to ask for divine mercy. When God's love comes into that, God's loving us. It's delightful when we have a lived experience of his love and our hearts are moved with gratitude. That's why I said at the beginning, like if I think about what am I in fact grateful for, that's always going to accompany, oops, a lived experience of God's love. The radiance of that blessing or mercy or his love that comes alive in my heart is spiritual consolation. Every felt increase in faith, hope, and love, all interior joy, which uh, attracts me to God and the things of God, um, where I feel secure, comforted, relieved, rested, happy, joyful, you name it, right? These are words of spiritual consolation. Thoughts, feelings, and desires that draw me closer to God and make it easier to do my, his will. If I'm resting, I'm basking in spiritual consolation, that consolation is going to crystallize into specific inspirations of how I should act. This is the way we're meant to live to receive God's love, and then to be inspired by that very love that I'm receiving right now to do particular things and say particular things, right? We are meant to live inspired lives, inspired, where God is breathing into us his great love for us. And that's what Christian virtue is, supernatural virtue is. I'm allowing the love of God to shape, direct, sustain, and inform my activities right now. So I'm sitting here at SEEK 2015, talking to a room full of hundreds and hundreds of awesome college students. And where is my heart resting? Well, like I said at the beginning, I have this sadness about Michelle and her diagnosis with cancer. But what am I doing as I'm speaking to you? I'm acknowledging and relating that to God, asking for his mercy, right? As I was telling you that story about the memory that came up from third grade a couple days ago when I was praying, I'm realizing how Jesus so much, again, it's like new waves and ways of how Jesus wants to provide for me. And that's ministering to this fear and sadness and helplessness around what Michelle's going through. I know God is going to provide. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I just can feel that kind of tension being ministered to in my heart. Right? And that's the way we're meant to live. Okay, so at any given moment in our lived experience, we're in one of these two patterns, okay? And if you recognize yourself anywhere over here uh, in the unlove or carrying some pain or fear or in desolation or suffering temptation or suffering the misery that results from sin, either your sin or anyone else's sin against you, be not afraid because the God of mercy is coming to us to minister to us in all those needs. So when someone fails to love me, like someone in the hotel is just rude to you and treats you with anger and impatience, okay? The love of God wants to come in and provide for and minister to whatever was damaged there. Any pain or any fear that got stirred up from that unlove, God's love wants to provide. When I'm desolate, God is always laboring to console me. When I'm tempted, God in his love and grace is always giving me the graces necessary to resist temptation. If I have sinned, if my temptation was unresisted and I end up sinning, God is coming to me in his unconditional love with the mercy, the particular form of mercy that we call forgiveness and the sacrament of reconciliation. Even if I'm dead in sin, uh, I went without confession from my first confession in second grade till 
uh, the end of my sophomore year in college, like 14 years, I didn't go to confession. I was dead in any number of sins. And yet what was God doing in his unconditional love, laboring, calling, uh, trying to shout to break through my deafness, shining the light of his love to break through my blindness, as Augustine says in the, um, in the confessions, so that I would come to him and receive his mercy. And when I made that first confession, since my first confession, like 14 years later, my life was changed. My heart was broken open to receive a whole new lived experience of God's uh, love and presence and power. So we have nothing to fear if we find what's dominating our heart at a given moment looks like any of this stuff. Because the love of God, his desire to bless us, his mercy poured out for us in Jesus will conquer overwhelmingly. St. Paul writes, what shall we say this? What then shall we say to this? That was not the gift of tongues breaking out. That's just. (laughs) What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you carry any self-condemnation in your heart? Self-recrimination? Are you beating yourself up? Are you carrying this burden of a judgment against yourself? Will you believe yourself to be unlovable? God in his love wants to set you free from that misery. Who can, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not also give us everything else along with him? Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who acquits us. Who will condemn It is Christ Jesus who died, rather was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father, begging the Father to pour out his love and mercy upon you. That's what Jesus is doing right now, that he lives at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword, all these different kinds of suffering? as it is written. No, in all these things, we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. Not just like, hey, we'll get by. It'll be okay. We can kind of just go another day. The love of Jesus Christ conquers overwhelmingly in the face of every possible misery we can experience in our humanity. Physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, psychological suffering, relational suffering, societal sufferings and miseries. In the face of all of it, the love of Jesus, God in Jesus Christ conquers and conquers overwhelmingly. Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. Strengthen my faith to receive your mercy. No, in all these things, we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels or principalities, present things or future things, powers, height, or depth, or any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. No, nothing, anything can possibly separate me from the love of God. The worst sin you've ever committed in your life cannot separate you from the love of God if you will but ask his forgiveness. No brokenness in your family, no trauma or suffering or violence that's ever been done against you can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. It may have done damage to you. It may have been a burden that you've carried for years. Today, Jesus wants to set you free in the power of his merciful love, which conquers overwhelmingly. Amen. Ask for God's mercy. I beg you, right? Ask for God's mercy. Don't try to figure it out or fix it on your own. Don't try to manage it or just make the best of it or leave it behind or just kind of muddle through. Turn to Jesus and ask for his love to come into any misery, self-inflicted or inflicted on you by another or the brokenness of the world for you. Ask for God's mercy. And as we pray in the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus says in the gospel, go and learn the meaning of it is mercy I desire, not sacrifice. Jesus calls us, having received his mercy, to be merciful to our brothers and sisters, uh, corresponding to our whole humanity. The love of God, the mercy of God, 
uh, is powerful to minister to everything in us, in our physical bodies and in our souls, in our mind, our intellect, our memory, our understanding, our will, our emotions, our psychology, everything about us. The love of God is active and is powerful. So the corporal works of mercy, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked. Think of all the charities that the church undertakes. This is why because these are practical expressions of the mercy of God. Love poured out on human misery or suffering in all of its forms. Shelter the homeless, visit the sick, ransom the captive, bury the dead. Spiritual works of mercy, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the, doubt, the doubtful, to admonish sinners, say more about that in a second, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive offenses willingly, say more about that in a second, to comfort the afflicted, and to pray for the living and the dead. Okay? Visiting the sick. I want to just linger on three of these. When I was uh, a few years ordained a priest, a good friend of mine, um, Chris and Jennifer, they have a, a large family, and uh, Jennifer was pregnant again, and they knew there was a problem in the pregnancy with their baby girl, who they named Gemma. And Gemma had a chromosomal abnormality that caused uh, all sorts of confusion in her uh, basically in her circulation and uh, organs outside of her body and uh, all sorts of difficulties, right? But mainly in her, the way her heart and lungs would work. And of course, uh, doctors being dopey as they can be, were counseling for them to have an abortion. That was never a consideration for this beautiful, faithful family. And so they brought Gemma to term. And when she was born, she was immediately in neonatal ICU. Um, I'd come to know Chris and Jennifer in Sioux Falls. I'd moved away to Brookings, to SDSU. Any SDSU people around? <laughs> Woo! Go Jackrabbits. Uh, as campus chapel there. And so uh, the day she was born, Chris and Jennifer asked me to come and visit them. So I'm driving like an hour down to Sioux Falls. And as I'm going, I'm a priest. I've been ordained like two and a half years. And... Um, I just, I just felt the poverty of it. Like, what can I do? This is such a sad deal, right? Uh, this child, 90% likely is going to die. Uh, what can you say to mom and dad who just gave birth to their daughter, who love her, and she's going to die? And I'm like walking into the hospital and I'm praying like, Lord, have mercy. May your love, Lord, come into the situation of sadness and suffering. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. And um, just was feeling my own poverty, telling God about that. And I got up to the room, and they were in neonatal ICU. If you've ever been, worked in a hospital, a lot of parents, when their little newborn babies are that critically ill, they just can't bear to be in the incubators and everything. It's just too much. So they'll come in and visit, and then they'll go away. Chris and Jennifer had set up camp right next to the incubator with their baby girl. And in fact, she was able to be out sometimes wrapped in a blanket, Jennifer was holding her when I came in, all these tubes. And I was talking to them, and <clears throat> she was really, they were suffering because uh, Chris is a, a physical therapist. He helps with orthopedic surgeries. So he has all sorts of doctor friends, and they're all coming in, specialists, um, giving all sorts of contradictory advice. You could try to do these surgeries. Very likely a child will die during surgery. Or what are you going to do? And they didn't know what to do. So I'm there and I'm just trying to be present. And uh, Jennifer, who is holding her daughter, is sometimes in the conversation, sometimes not. So I'm talking with Chris and doctors are interrupting. And at one point I look over at Jennifer, the mom, and she is beaming with joy. Out of all this stress and beaming with joy. And I said, Jennifer, when she kind of came back to us, I said, can you tell me what you were just thinking of there? And she said, oh, Father, I was just looking at Gemma's fingers, and she has, she has perfect hands. And I, I had to keep kind of a poker face, because I was like, oh. I looked at Gemma's hands, and as part of the chromosomal thing that was going on, her fingers were all bent over each other like that, on both hands. But what was going on in this mom's heart when she saw the deformity of her daughter's hands, in her mom's heart, 
God was consoling her, his mercy coming into the sadness. And it was saying to her, her hands are perfect. To be merciful and answer mercy. I said, Jennifer, you want to keep paying attention to that. If you let your heart rest in that joy because of your daughter's perfect hands, you'll know exactly what to do. And they did. So through all the confusion, this experience of God's love cleared it all away. And they wanted to bring their daughter home to meet their brothers and sisters. And they thought she might live for about a day. In fact, she lived for eight days. A perfect octave of life. It was very Catholic, right? <laughs> and died peacefully in their beds, surrounded by mom and dad and her brothers and sisters. And of course, there's still sadness, but it's sadness deeply in touch with the love of God and the gift that God had given. Very in touch with his mercy in the middle of that. Listen, when we see people who are suffering, we have a great opportunity to bring love to bear. And love conquers overwhelmingly. If the love in my heart that I can bring to a brother or sister is Christ's own love, it can make all the difference in the world. I encourage you to ask Jesus, Jesus, show me people in my normal pattern of life, the people I'm staying with here at Seek, someone I have a chance encounter with. Let my heart be sensitive to any misery or suffering or burden that they may carry. And then show me how I can be an instrument of your mercy, how I can bring love to bear in a way that will make a real difference for that person. A, B, C, ask for God's mercy, be, be merciful. And to live the great news of God's mercy in Jesus Christ, we must trust him. And I just want to say that the only way that trust grows in relationship with Jesus, where I can learn to receive his mercy and be generous and compassionate in being an instrument of his mercy more effectively in my daily life, is to grow in intimacy with him. And so I want to leave you with this encouragement. If I'm going to have an intimate relationship with someone these two things are true. I know their thoughts, I know their feelings, I know their desires, and they know mine because we've chosen to share with each other what's going on. Jesus wants an intimate relationship with you. He doesn't want to be an acquaintance of yours or a buddy of yours. He wants to have a communion of intimate love with you and with me. Thanks be to God. And so Jesus has revealed himself. That's divine revelation. We can read about Jesus' heart and mind, his thoughts, feelings, and desires in Scripture. God has made himself known. But in our relationship with him, God awaits for us to make ourselves known to him. Yes, he's omniscient. He knows us better than we know ourselves. But he, if someone comes up to you that you've never talked to and says, hey, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. I know what you want, right? That's not intimate, that's creepy. <laughs> and if you remember nothing, remember this, Jesus Christ is not a creeper, okay? <laughs> so while he desires intimacy with you and me, he wants us to enter into intimacy the way we're made for intimacy, by freely choosing to make ourselves known to him, okay? So whatever's going on, ask yourself this question. If Jesus only knew about me, the stuff that I actually shared with him, that I chose to tell him about, how well would he know me? And if the answer isn't, he would know me way better than my best friend or my spouse, there's a lot more for us to grow in, in intimacy with him, by simply choosing to honestly tell him about whatever's going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what we'll learn, the more you take up that invitation, is that Jesus' love for you and for me really is unconditional. So when I'm being up, I'm having a bad day. I'm being a jerk. I, had a, I was telling my good priest friend over here the other day, I had the flu last week, that influenza A. I was in bed for like a week. I haven't been that sick for forever. I had a total collapse of my prayer life. I run around the country teaching people how to pray and the importance of a daily prayer life. And I was so like angry with myself and ashamed that I hadn't prayed for days and days and days, right? It was, it was horrible. And as I kind of came out of that whole funk, I was kind of sheepish coming back to Jesus. A lot of accusations, like, who do you think you are? Oh, now you're turning to Jesus? Right, you know, like all the enemy, like coming at me, all this misery. And as I told Jesus about it, I'm just met with unconditional love. 
That's what we learn when we tell Jesus all about it, honestly, the good, the bad, and the ugly, that his love is unwavering. It is truly unconditional. And that helps to build trust. Jesus, I can lean on this love no matter what I'm suffering, whether it's a little paper cut or like a, an amputation. Your love conquers overwhelmingly. It will not fail. And I want to run to you and receive the love that you desire to give to me. Two big questions to pray with on a regular basis. Jesus, three, sorry, three big questions. Jesus, is there anything in my heart you want to touch with your healing love? No, it is two questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. And wait and see. And if there's hurtful or burdensome or desolate or painful things that come up, tell him all about it. Ask him to reveal his love and his presence. Secondly, Jesus, is there anyone to whom you want me to be an instrument of mercy? Holy Spirit of God, where can I bring love to bear where love, where suffering is happening, where misery is abiding? Sometimes that'll be, I need to forgive someone that I'm holding resentment against. A lot of times it'll just be inspirations to show kindness, to be an instrument of mercy in a very concrete, intangible way. There's a lonely person. I'm going to go and spend some time with them. Here's a person who's sad. I'm going to say a word of comfort. I'm going to write them a little note. Simple things that done in the love of Christ can make all the difference. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. And I thank you for your merciful love that has brought us all here for this weekend. Heavenly Father, in Jesus, your Son, our Savior, our merciful Redeemer, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Jesus, there is nothing lacking in your super abundant love. I believe it. Help me in my unbelief. But Jesus, expand each of our heart's capacity to receive the fullness of the love, the full measure of your love, which you desire to pour out and lavish upon us. Draw us deep into the ocean of your merciful love, Lord, that trusting in you, secure in you, healed by you, set free by you, inspired by you, we can be instruments of your mercy to our brothers and sisters. Help us, Lord, to be amazed at the power of your love at work for us so that we can work amazingly as instruments of your love for one another to the praise and glory of God the Father. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you. We Christians have the audacity to look at the night sky and somehow feel loved. The definition of the devil, the name that I think sums up his identity more accurately than any other, is this, the angel of the abyss. Tolerance is disagreeing with someone and then putting up with them. Obama was asked when he was running for president the first time, what is sin? teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. Present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide. Shalom World TV. Twenty four seven, faith filled, dynamic, virtue building, commercial free, family friendly, Catholic charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer.
attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. With great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom.